Good afternoon, everyone. It's time for Mrs. Blue Reads, and this afternoon we're starting a new book. The Time Warp Trio, Knights of the Kitchen Table by John Saskia. And pictures by Lane Smith. And let's see who it's published by. Published by Viking Press. Knights of the Kitchen Table. Halt, vile knaves, prepare to die. Is he talking to us? asked Fred. I looked around the small clearing. A dirt path went from one end to the other. Fred and Sam and I stood at one end. A large guy and a black horse stood at the other. He was dressed from head to toe in black armor, like you see in those books about knights and castles. I don't see any other vile knaves around, I said. Sam cleaned his glasses on his t-shirt and took another look at the end of the path. Yes, there is a black knight down there. The sun glinted off a very real and very sharp-looking sword hanging from the black knight's side. And yes, he looks like he's planning to hurt us, added Sam. Hey, it's not my fault, I said. I told Fred not to open it. You did not, said Fred. Did too. Did not. Did too. Excuse me, guys, said Sam. Can we discuss this later? I think that large, angry man in the black can is getting ready to kill us now. The Black Knight lowered his lance and set his shield in front of him. Um, hello there, Mr. Knight, sir, I called across the clearing. My name is Joe. My friends and I seem to have lost our way for my birthday party. If you could just take us to the nearest phone, none shall pass, boomed the Black Knight. If you could just point the way towards New York, we'll be on our way, and none shall pass. I think I heard that somewhere before, said Sam. Thy tongue and garb are passing strange. Methinks thy band hails not from the shore. What did he say, asked Fred. He said we look funny and we're probably not from around here, I said. And right you are, Sir Knight, I called across the clearing. I threw in that sir part because they always talk like that in night books. We are not from around here, and we would just as soon get out of here. So if you just point that long, sharp stick of yours, silent infidels or mayhap enchanters in thy weird robes and boots. We looked at each other. We were all wearing jeans, t-shirts, and sneakers. We looked at the black knight. He had on pointed metal shoes, armored pants, an armored coat with hinges at the elbows and shoulders, and a huge metal helmet that looked like a black bell, all topped off with a fluffy black feather. His horse was likewise done up in a black skirt, a black saddlebag, an armchair, and a matching helmet thing with a fluffy black feather. Weird robes and boots, said Sam. Look who's talking, the tin man with feathers. He even dresses his horse funny. Enough of thy evil spells and chants, magicians. Prepare to die. I think I lacked none shall pass better than that. Prepare to die stuff, said Sam. Black Knight flight flipped down his visor on his helmet. Do something, said Fred. Like what? I said. Like, like, like say some magic words. Black Knight spurred his horse into a trot. Please? Thank you? Not those magic words, you idiot. Real magic words, like the ones your Uncle Joe uses. Abracadabra? The horse picked up speed. Hocus pocus, I shouted. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The Black Knight thundered toward us, his lance pointed directly at us. We were about to be killed more than a thousand years before we were even born. Chapter 2. But before the Black Knight arrives, maybe I should explain how three regular guys happened to find themselves facing death by shish kebab. It all started with my birthday party. My two best friends, Friend and Sam, were over at my house. We were just sitting around the kitchen table doing birthday kinds of things. You know, eating junk, drinking soda, looking at the baseball my sister gave me. My mom started scooping up wrapping paper to throw away. That's when Sam found the other present. Hey, Joe, here's one you missed. Sam held up a small rectangular present. It's wrapped in black and gold paper. Who's it from? My mom read the card and made a sour face. Your Uncle Joe. Yahoo! Uncle Joe was the best uncle anybody could ever have. He was a magician for a traveling circus, and his presents were always the best. Uncle Joe's stage name was Joe the Magnificent. I was named after him before he went off the deep end, my mother always added. Here he is, Joe the Magnificent. The card says, Happy Birthday, Magician in Training. Be careful what you wish for. You might get it. This is weird paper, said Sam, wiggling the present back and forth in the light. 
I bet it's one of those disappearing coin trick boxes, said Fred. I took the present. Maybe it's a magic cape that can make things disappear. That would have come in handy last year. You could have made it, used it to make all those rabbits disappear. Mom still had her sour face on. Well, that wasn't really Uncle Joe's fault, I said. I gave the hat the wrong command. Come on already, open it, said Fred. I pulled back the black and gold paper and lifted it up. It's a, it's a, aw, oh, it's just a book, said Fred, rolling my baseball around the table. And it was a book, but it wasn't like any book I had ever seen before. It was such a dark, dark blue that it almost looked black, like the sky at night. It had gold stars and moons along the edge and twisting silver designs on the front and back that looked like writing from a long time ago. Where's the book? I looked closer and read the title. The Book. Great name for a book, said Sam. Mom looked relieved. Hey, let's see. Fred dropped the baseball on the kitchen table and grabbed the book out of my hand. Wait a minute, Fred. Be careful. Fred opened the book. There was a picture of a guy on a black horse standing on a path at the edge of a small clearing. He was dressed from head to toe in black armor like you see in those books about knights and castles. He didn't look very happy. Oh man, said Fred, wouldn't it be great to see knights and all that stuff for real? Wisps of pale green mist began to swirl around the kitchen tails. Joseph Arthur, close that book and stop that smoking this instant. I grabbed the book and slammed it shut. The mist rose over the table, the stove, and the refrigerator. Mom in the kitchen disappeared. And just for a second, I got that feeling you get when you dream you're falling. Then the mist and the feeling were gone, and Fred and Sam and I were standing at the edge of the clearing. We stood at one end of a small path, and at the other end stood the Black Knight. Chapter 3. The Black Knight thundered toward us, his lance pointed directly at us. Wait, I've got it, said Fred, and he grabbed our arms and pulled us together. You guys stay close. On the count of three, Joe, you and Sam jump to the left. I'll jump to the right. One, the black knight was so close I could see the straps on his armor. Two, I could see the straps on the, the buckles on the straps. Three, we jumped. The black knight clanked by like a runaway train. Strike three, said Sam. Fred jumped back on the path. He stuck his thumbs in his ears and waggled his fingers, shouting, nah, nah, you missed us. Nah, 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 nah. Fred, are you nuts? What are you doing? I yelled. Let's get out of here before he gets that horse turned around. That's just what we want, said Fred. He's too heavy and slow to hit us. We'll wear him out. And then he yelled to the Black Knight, Come on, you big tin can. Give it another shot. Sam and I stood back on the path. Oh, great idea, Fred, said Sam. He didn't kill us the first time, so let's give him another chance. I wonder if his mother ever told him it's not polite to point sharp things at other people. Stand as men, you cursed knaves roared the Black Knight. He seemed even more unhappy than he was before. Yeah, yeah, called Fred. Come and get us, Tin Man. Black Knight yelled back, prepare to die, foul mouth, mouth enchanters. I know you are, but what am I? asked Sam. Same thing on three, said Fred. One, Black Knight trotted toward us. Two, we could hear his sandals squeaking and his horse huffing and snorting. Three, we jumped. The lance whistled through nothing but air. Strike two, called Sam. One more ought to just about do it, said Fred, picking up a hefty stick, and then he yelled, Your mother was a sardine can. The Black Knight turned and raised his visor. He didn't look mad anymore. He looked positively crazy. Demon sorcerers, foul wizards, vanish not into the mist, stand and die. I really wish he'd stop using that D word, said Sam. The Black Knight kicked his horse into a trot. One, he aimed his lance at us once more. Two, his horse stumbled and wheezed. Three, we jumped. The horse clomped slowly past us. The Black Knight waved his lance weakly over our heads. Fred jumped up, swung his stick with all his might, and whacked the back of the Black Knight's helmet. Bong! The helmet rang like a thousand church bells. The Black Knight sat up straight, wobbled, and then fell to the ground with an armored crash. His horse stopped and lowers its head, sweating mightily and still gasping for air, but looking pretty relieved about dropping its heavyweight passenger. Going, going, gone. That one's out of here, said Sam. Now let's do likewise before Mr. Fun wakes up and starts with that prepare to die stuff again. No hurry now, I said. With all that armor on, he won't be able to get up by himself when he does come to. Fred gave the fallen black knight another whack with a stick and planted a sneaker on his chest. All hail, Sir Fred, I said. 
All hail, Sir Eek, said Sam. Sir Eek, Sam pointed to the edge of the clearing. Three more knights on horses with swords drawn were galloping down the path toward us. Chapter 4. The three knights charged. Ten feet away, they stopped. The lead knight, carrying a white shield with a red cross, raised a huge sword over his head and, and, and said, Hail, Sir Fred! Hail, Sir Fred, said the two knights behind him. Phew, said Sam. Phew, asked the tall knight with a red cross shield. He means phew and greeting, Sir Knight. Are we glad to see you, I said. Praise Jesus, but you, sirs, speak fair strange as thy dress. You must be a very strong magic to vanquish non-black knight with a mere oaken staff. The pile of armor wiggled a leg and moaned. For he has slew many of our good knights of the round table. For real? The round table, I said. I know you of our fellowship. What did he say? asked Fred. Have we ever heard of them? I whispered. And then I answered, are you kidding? King Arthur and all that stuff? Of course we've heard of you guys. Kidding? Stuff? What saith he? asked the Red Cross Knight's friend. Methinks they know of us, whispered the tall one. Sure, I said, I've read all about you guys. The Sword and the Stone, Lancelot and Guinevere, Merlin the Magician. Read? Thou reads the written word as Merlin does? Well, mostly Daredevil, Superman, and X-Men, said Sam. X-Men? asked the White Knight's pal. Books of spells or fellow wizards, no doubt, said the White Knight. Faith, it must be a sign. You enchanters three have been sent to deliver us of our troubles. I am Sir Lancelot. These are my companions, Sir Percival and Sir Gawain. Sir Lancelot, I gasped. This guy was supposed to be the greatest knight who ever lived, except for maybe his son, Sir Galahad. And here he was asking us to help him. Well, I am Joe, uh, uh, Sir Joe the Magnificent, I said, borrowing my uncle's stage name. These are my companions, Sir Fred the Awesome and Sir Sam the, um, Sir Sam the Unusual. Sam gave me a nasty look. Well, enchanters, welcome. But we have not a moment to lose, said Lancelot. Camelot is besieged by Smog the dragon from the west and by Bleobob, Bleo, yeah, the giant from the east. Mount behind us. We ride at once. Huh? said Fred, still striking a heroic pose on the Black Knight's chest. He said if we hitch a ride with them, we can go to King Arthur's castle and fight a dragon and a giant. That's great, said Sam. You invite us to a birthday party, almost get us run through by a black knight, and now you get us into a fight with a dragon and a giant? Remind me not to come to any more of your parties, Sir Joe the Magnificent. We hopped on the horses behind Sir Lancelot, Sir Percival, and Sir Gawain. Gawain, excuse me. But dragons and giants and things like that aren't for real, said Fred. I didn't think the Knights of the Round Table were for real either, I said, but if they're not, who will be riding behind and where are we going? Chapter 5. This will be our last chapter for today. Fred, Sam, and I stood in the middle of the Great Hall of Camelot. Torches sputtered on stone walls that disappeared high in the darkness above. Knights and ladies dressed in robes and cloaks of all colors surrounded us. Dogs and little kids ran in and out of the crowd. Welcome, enchanters, said a tall, serious-looking fellow. It had to be King Arthur. Who else would be wearing a crown and sitting on a throne in the middle of Camelot? Sir Lancelot tells me thou hast rid us of that scourge, the Black Knight. How can we show our thanks? Oh, thankest you, your honor. I mean, your sire, your, your majesty, I said in my best old-time English. That was mostly Sir Fred's work. Fred raised his stick and took a bow. The crowd oohed and awed. Maybe you could help us out, King Sir uh, Sire. I said, see, we were in the middle of a birthday party at my house, and we'd like to get back before the ice cream melts. Do you know the way to New York? King Arthur slid his crown back and scratched his head. York? Yes. But New York? New York? Yeah, that's it, said Sam. Hmm. The name ringeth no chimes. Merlin, knowest thou this place, New York? An old guy in a long blue-black robe and tall cone hat shuffled forward. He looked us over with flashing green eyes that gave me the willies. I know not New York, but methinks these three be poor enchanters who cannot find their own way home. The surrounding crowd murmured, Nasty old coot, whispered Fred. Who asked him to butt in? Maybe I should just give him a whack with my stick before he gives us any more trouble. Another great idea from the mind of Sir Fred, whispered Sam. Hit the king's magician. I'm sure he won't mind. He'd probably reward us with his place to stay for the rest of our lives. A place like a dungeon, maybe. There they are, looking at Merlin. 
I could see we were losing the crowd. I had to do something fast. Oh, we're enchanters, all right. I said, I am Sir Joe the Magnificent. The crowd, odd. We had them back. Would you show us some small spell of enchantment for our amusement, Sir Joe the Magnificent? Asked Merlin. And then he stood there giving us one of those looks teachers give when they ask you a question they know you could never answer in a million years. Yes, please show us a spell, said the lady sitting next to King Arthur, Queen Guinevere. How could I turn down the queen? Spell, you say? My palms got sweaty while I stalled for time trying to think. Yes, a little spell. Spells? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure, said Sam. Sir Joe the Magnificent here is a regular magician. I thought of Uncle Joe. Magic? Of course. Bring me cards. The court jester brought a deck of cards with all sorts of crazy pictures on them. There were no suits or numbers that I could tell, just a lot of strange pictures. I shuffled the cards and pressed the deck to my forehead like the real Joe the Magnificent did at his shows. Yes, I am feeling the power of the cards now. Could I have a volunteer from the audience? The queen stepped forward. She stood right next to me, and I thought I would faint. She was so beautiful. No wonder Lancelot was crazy about her. I reshuffled the cards and tried to concentrate on the trick. Just a deck of cards, nothing up my sleeve. Now you see them, now you don't. I fanned out the deck face down. Pick a card, any card. Sam groaned. Guinevere picked. Show everyone the card, please. And while everyone looked at the queen's card, I snuck a peek at the card I would put right in front of hers. It was a guy hanging upside down. Now place it back on the deck, and I will have the card speak to me and tell me which of one of them you picked. I carefully reshuffled the deck to keep the hangman in front of Queen Guinevere's card. Then I muttered all of the magic words I could think of. Hocus pocus, prestos change, presto changeo, open sesame, the cards are about to speak. I flipped the cards slowly and made a big deal of listening to each one, just like Uncle Joe did. The crowd wasn't making a sound. I flipped the hangman. I flipped the next card, listened to it for an extra second, and then held it up. Your card, my lady. The magician card, tis truth, said Guinevere. The crowd cheered. Guinevere kissed me. I turned to Jelly. Face, sir, a fair little trick croaked that Kiljor Merlin. But can thou do a true enchantment, a spell to change man to frog or to vanish in thin air? There's Queen Guinevere, Guinevere with her card. The challenge hung there like a bad smell in the phone booth. The crowd went silent, waiting for our answer. Suddenly, a messenger burst through the doors at the far end of the great hall. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Bleobob, the giant stands at the very castle door. He demands three bears damsels to eat instantly. King Arthur looked worried. The fair damsel and the crowd looked worse than that. Another messenger dashed into the hall, nearly running over the first. Smog the dragon has been seen flying from the west. He will be at the castle walls in minutes. Aha, said Merlin with that evil teacher voice and smile again. Here's a perfect test for our enchanters. Go ahead and hit him with your stick, Fred, said Sam. At least we'll be safe from giants and dragons down in the dungeon. Fred lifted a stick. No, no, we can't do that, I said. What do you suggest we do, Mr. Magnificent, said Sam. I looked at Merlin, then at Queen Guinevere. I think we should go find out if dragons and giants are for real. That ends our reading for today. Next, turn in next week, chapters 6 through 10, to find out if dragons and giants are for real in this adventure with the Time Warp Trio and what they do to get back home. Thanks for listening. Bye. Have a great day.